Welcome to Inside the Markets, StockPulse.com production. Today we'll be talking with Alan Berry Labacam of the Alan Berry Reports. Alan also runs Advanced Gold, AAX, on the venture. And for those familiar with our podcast, Alan provides some invaluable commentary for these junior miners. Alan, appreciate the time here as always. Well, we've kind of set the table here for investors, I think, starting the year. But let's run through maybe how we identify these companies and, and let these investors uh, do some of their own homework here. So uh, how do you kind of see uh, see the health of the sector and, and, and where we are here in early January 2020? Well, yeah, I kind of look at this as an inside the juniors kind of a show. And um, why I wanted to do that at this time, Rob, is I'm very bullish on the price of gold, silver, copper, zinc, but I think it's important for people to realize that just because you're bullish on those commodities doesn't mean that, you know, I expect to see all boats rising. Uh, in fact, I expect to see a lot of the boats not rising because they have no, they don't deserve to rise. And so, you know, you want to, what we do on the show is we provide commentary in our uh, commodity briefs. Uh, we do the Junior Mining Weekly. We do the uh, the the um, uh, treasure hunter shows, and really, what I'm I'm putting all those companies in those various shows through my filters, and I thought that you know why not talk about those filters so people can get a understanding of you know why the companies we pick are different than the other boats that I think belong sinking, not uh, not flourishing. Uh, even in a stronger market for those commodities. Well, let's get into some of these filters. I know investors have their own way of analyzing stocks, but uh, how do you dig in? What, uh, what's your starting point? Well, I sort of have four pillars that I look at. And how I look at them, the order I look at them, I think is just as important as the individual. I hear a lot of analysts and, and, and in this space talk about people, people, people. And I agree, people are very important. But um, I think that you can learn a lot about the people from other indicators. And there's one thing that I've seen over the over my career is that, you know, when you try to go after these deals that all these marquee guys are involved with, after they've sort of had their big success, um, they tend to, um, you know, they live a better life. They're not as hungry as they used to be. Uh, instead of $30 bottles of wine, they drink $300 bottles of wine. And, you know, so expecting because somebody made a past discovery that they're going to make another one, um, that is often a recipe for disaster in investing. Uh, and so the number one key that I, the one, one number one part of my filter system is drill results. If I don't really care who's involved, um, you know, you can have scoundrels making discoveries or you can have brilliant people making discoveries. What I care about is the drill rig, the drill results first and foremost. There's a reason that they call it the truth machine in the business, the drill rig, and that's because it has a way of being a good separator between hopes and dreams and reality. And I'm only really interested in the reality side of things, not the uh, not the hopes and dreams kind of things. Uh, you know, that betting on hopes and dreams uh, is uh, is a res another recipe for disaster in this space. On the other hand, trying to understand the drill results and even before you understand the drill results, Rob, you can learn a lot from how eager a company is to get drilling. And then when they have a discovery, you can tell a lot by where they focus that drilling, uh, can tell you a lot about the, the thinking of the management team. For example, you could have a, a, a situation where, you know, they, they get a high grade uh, uh, discovery in one spot on their claims and, and then they run over to another spot because it looks good and then they kind of leave that one spot alone. Well, if that original spot that got everybody excited was, was the greatest thing since sliced bread, why are they moving over to the other deposit? Or, um, for example, 
why are they focusing in on on drilling a resource when they haven't really even finished drilling off the limits of the deposit. Um, finding the limits of the deposit to me are more important than coming up with a resource because if you don't understand the limits of the deposit, you can't really understand, well, what has the best potential of being mined in that deposit because oftentimes the whole deposit can't be mined. Now, there are juniors that, you know, there's sometimes there's a couple steps they've got to make before they can, maybe they're eager to drill, but they're waiting on funding or they're waiting on permitting. Well, in those kind of scenarios, Rob, what I'd recommend is that, you know, if you are watching a company based on, well, we need funding or we need permits, and then the company's going to be eager to get in there drilling, well, if they're not, if they get the funding and they get the, the uh, permits and then they don't quickly get the drilling happening, well, it tells you a little bit about how eager they were to get in there and drill that, the target that they were promoting you on. Um, and so, you know, that, that brings up another really important point to me is that when you're looking at a junior, the, one of the, one of the, first things you want to determine is are they stock promoters or are they promoting the project? Um, stock promoters tend to want to talk to you about, well, the stock's 10 cents today, it's undervalued, we've got all these great people coming in, the stock's tight and it's going to move up. You know, these are the, the general pitches that you'll hear in the junior space about the stock. Oh, we've got this new group coming in. There's there's a new marketing plan. Our 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 top guy's going to England. He's talking to a bunch of institutions. Or, you know, those are all stock promotion related pitches. Okay. On the other hand, if you've got a company, say example, this uh, Kintivar that we recently did a, uh, a hidden treasures on because I like their prospects for a copper discovery. If you listen to that whole thing, I, 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 I don't think Carol, the guy who runs the company, was interested in, in talking about the stock unless I asked him. I might have asked him about the structure or something like that. His whole focus was on the drilling, what they're, what they're drilling, why they're drilling it, what got them excited to drill it. Um, those are the hallmarks of a promotion based on the project and so the, the the key sort of differentiator between those two types of promotions is often the truth machine you like I said you want to with, with Carol he was wanting to talk about well we did this uh, surface uh, sampling and then we brought the dozers in and we cleared away a bunch of the uh, overburden and we exposed a big uh, big outcropping of rock that we could because it was on a cliff we could see like a cross structure of the deposit which gave us a better understanding of the mineralization and you know all of that is a very good indicator between the difference stock promoters chronically i've even had instances where i've called up the investor relation person and i said look you don't need to give me the stock promotion. I'm not interested. In fact, like they say when you're arrested, uh, you know, uh, you, you don't need to say anything because what you say could be used against you. <laughs> when, when some promoter wants to use the, the stock promotion uh, with me, I use it against them because I know, okay, I'm potentially looking at a stock promotion here. Now, Having said that, uh, you know, it's not like you can't make some money on a uh, stock promotion. I'm not saying that. Sometimes there's a lot of money to be made on a stock promotion. What I'm saying is that if you get 10 stock promotions compared to 10 serious promotions of the project, you're going to lose more often on the stock promotions than you win uh, than compare, and by a long way compared to quality to be promoting the projects over the stock. So if right by, by uh, just focusing on those, 
you reduce your your chances for for severe losses and that's the other problem with uh, stock promotions over project promotions is that when you lose money you tend to lose all your money and then you're waiting for a rollback and uh, you know you the old saying of at the beginning of a stock promo, this is go has been around Vancouver for a long time. At the beginning of a stock promotion, the the promoter has the dream, and the investor has the money. At the end of the stock promotion, the the promoter has the money, and the investor has the dream. Try to stay away from that. Yeah, certainly. And uh, as we move on here to pillar two, uh, I'll venture a guess at it. I, I, I have to believe that share structure somewhere in your, your top here. Um, a lot of destruction in this sector the past decade. Companies worth a fraction of their, their highest valuations. Um, what's, your, what's your thoughts on that and, and, and what is your pillar two? Yeah, well, you hit on it. Yeah, the share structure of a company is number two on my list, even uh, before the people. And when I talk about share structure, I'll, I think if you listen to what I just said about uh, the drill results and the drill and the focus of the drilling and what the team wants to do with the drilling and how they market themselves based on the drilling, um, then you look at the share structure and some of the things you want to look for, first of all, is insider ownership. And before I get into that, actually, what we're trying to avoid here are broken share structures, companies that have two, three, four hundred million shares out. And by looking at these various different indicators, it'll tell you whether you've, you're heading down the road of a potential for a broken share structure and, or, or not. Okay, so one of the hurdles is insider ownership. Chronically, companies that have broken share structures also have low insider ownership. It kind of makes sense logically if you think about it. If, you know, if, a, if an insider owns or a group of insiders own 25, 30% of the stock, well, they're not going to be in a real big rush to, uh, you know, to, uh, promote the hell out of the stock to try to get some funding so that they can pay themselves. Their motivation is to see this, the value of the company increase, which moves up the price of the stock, which makes them a whole lot more money in their shareholding than, um, than, than you know, pumping the stock up to some ludicrous valuation purely on, you know, stock promotion and so that they can get paid and then once that promotion's over guess what happens the stock price goes back down they get their big wages and, uh, and they go to the parties and the conferences and they spend lots of money on wine and and having a good time and um, and then the shareholders left holding the bag um, another indicator of um, potential for broken share structures are projects that are in remote locations. Remote location projects have high costs. They, they have, they are helicopter supported. Um, so, you know, I've, I've, and this is a problem that, I, I mean, I, I just flabbergasted sometimes by the things I hear, but I heard of one guy that had a project up in the golden triangle that, you know, he cared so little about shareholder money and guess what? Also, low insider uh, ownership of that company. That uh, one time he took a helicopter from the top of the mountain just down to the down to the town nearby just to have lunch. That was like a ten thousand uh, dollar lunch. And the, don't kid yourself. This kind of nonsense happens a lot in the mining business, uh, in the exploration, development, and in the mining business. And I think it's purely because they don't really care because they're, they're, what they care about is their wage and they don't really care about the structure of the stock or the performance of the stock because that's not where they're going to make their money. So, you know, insider ownership, staying away from projects in remote locations with, that are helicopter supported, that are diesel powered, which acts, adds to the um, uh, uh, cost. And 
ultimately a key, another key reason to avoid those kind of things is because to make a, a discovery in a remote location, helicopter supported, diesel powered, the threshold of what you have to find is dramatically different than a project with good infrastructure. I mean, you could find a low, low grade project with good infrastructure that will make you a ton more money than a project that's got high grade, kind of small and is remote and high, and high costs. So, you know, I mean, this people got to think about these things like a business more, not sort of like, a, you know, some fantasy stock promotion. Think like a businessman. Well, you know, if you got to fly everybody in there with helicopters and because it's a remote location, the helicopter's got to stay there all day in case there's an injury or anything like that. And, uh, and uh, you know, everything's powered by diesel because you don't have power going to the project. You don't have roads going to the project. Guess what you got to find to make a go of it there? You have to find something that is it pretty much idiot proof. It has to be nearly perfect. And Mother Nature doesn't work like that. So, you know, staying away from those kind of uh, uh, um, projects. And then another key indicator of a company that has low insider ownership and probably projects in remote locations is expensive marketing. You know, and this is a real serious one that more investors got to pay attention to. You got companies sometimes that are charging anywhere from 200000 to $2 million a year on on marketing, or two, 200 to 200,000 to 2 million a year on marketing. And, you know, sometimes they think the more money they spend on marketing, the less quality the marketing is. Uh, I see a lot of companies, and you do too, Rob, because when I look through the news releases every day, I give you a list of companies that I think should, uh, we would like to talk about on the commodity briefs or uh, at the, the week weekly show and you know how hard it is to get a hold of these guys they're you know they they they, they're really challenging to get a hold of they're so they're dropping the ball on a you're calling them up and you're not we're not trying to charge them to be on the show we want to talk about their news and and we have a big audience uh of investors that they could be talking to but uh, say, for example, some of these shows are getting anywhere from 500 to 2,500 views. I, I hate to inform these people that if they're going to these conferences where they have to spend tens of thousands of dollars to get to get into get the show, get a booth, get their people up there, get get you know all these costs, and they're lucky if they see 20 guys that might buy their stock. I mean. This is a broken model of uh, these various different conferences. I I run my own company, Advanced Gold, and you know how many conferences I'm going to this year? One, the PDAC. Because at the PDAC, I know I'm going to see a lot of investors, and I know that I can have meetings with uh, institutional people, and I can have meetings with uh, uh, industry, uh, bigger companies in the industry. So it's worthwhile. Other than that, Rob, we, my company spends very little on, on marketing, uh, because I don't drop the ball on digital marketing. Most of these companies, um, you know, they're, they're, it, they don't understand that it's much more effective and, uh, much cheaper to be doing videos, to be uh, doing, I'm going to talk about digital marketing ne uh, in a bit here because it's such a key pillar, but, you know, they would rather go spend all this money at these various different conferences uh, at where they're getting not much in the way of, uh, of effective uh, marketing, yet it's costing the company like I said earlier, anywhere from 200 grand to 2 million. And then people wonder why their stock share structure gets broken and the company ends up being a, being a, um, being a uh, rollback candidate down the road because of the broken share structure. That is 
stay away from broken shear structures and look for the indicators like I just pointed out of what causes broken shear structure companies. Well, moving on to your third pillar, might as well venture another guess. I've got to believe it's a management team and, and a good management team probably could have corrected your second pillar. So uh, what is pillar three for Alan Barry here? You're right on the money. Yeah, management is um, is crucial, and you know a lot of these. A lot of people say, "Well, it's people, people, people." You want to look for people that have had uh, success in the past. And as I said earlier, you know that is often a, a recipe for disaster. There's very few people that are um, that are um, that, that keep on serial entrepreneurs that have success and keep having success. Uh, Rob McCune's one of them, Ross Beatty's another, and then, the, you know, the list is pretty thin after that. Yale Simpson, I would consider a, a, a serial uh, a success story where they find something and they, they build it out and they get bought out. But I could a- also name you a series of guys like Chuck Fipke that, you know, he had his big success in Diamonds with Diamet. Um, but then he's had uh, promotions that were round trips for their shareholders multiple times after that, that, you know, investors lost a lot of money in, um, you know, so trying to find, uh, you know, based on just on, uh, well, the, it's a marquee name, I think is also a recipe for disaster. But when you're looking for people, if you look at the drill results, and the share structure, it tells you a lot about the quality. It's not just a marquee name because they've had success in the past. You watch how they do their drilling, how they uh, how they go about uh, where they drill, why they drill, what their share structure looks like, what's the insider ownership. Two of the guys that I just mentioned about big uh, serial success stories, um, guess what? They also have high insider ownership of their companies. In the case of McEwen Mining, he's the largest shareholder in the company. Uh, if you look at any of Ross Beatty's uh, companies, he always owns a big chunk of stock in all of those companies. And so, you know, they they are they are interested in not breaking their uh, their their share structure. Um, and, uh, and, you know, doing things in a way that, you know, they don't have to look at high costs and, and everything like that. So watching the drill results and the share structure is kind of like the report card of the people. And so, you know, uh, some, I'm, I'm often looking for the next marquee name and how to find the next marquee name is to, to look at their their uh, their report card, where are they drilling? Why are they drilling there? What work have they done to determine that that's a good place to drill? Why? It, what is their share structure looking like? A perfect example of this, where I think I've found a new marquee player is our our recent sponsor, Amex Exploration. They've got a great discovery that I've been following for a year now. And uh, it's got it's been a triple for me as a pick. I picked it around fifty cents. It's now a, a buck and a half. And if you go back and you look at all the the, the news releases and uh, and and look at the drilling of where they did the quality of the work that they did, how they explain that, it tells you that you know these guys are serious about what's on the ground, and then you look at the share structure of the company. Right now, they have I think probably north of fifteen million dollars in the treasury, and uh, and the the fully diluted is about sixty five million shares, and the insiders own. All, you see in a theme here, Rob. <laughs> you know the drill results are given. In the case of our sponsor Amex, the drill results are giving them a good mark on the. Uh, they're getting an A on the drill results. They're getting an A on the share structure, and guess what? They're getting an A on the performance as well. And so, but Kelly Malcolm, the the guy who's the sort of the the VP of exploration that we've spent uh, time with on our uh, talking on our um, on our uh, our. Um, which I'm gonna call it. I forget the name of our shows now. We talked about them on the Commodity Report, the Junior Mining Weekly, and I've done a uh, hidden treasures on them. 
that's why you know why they they fi- we find them in those places is because you know that guy, although Kelly's not a household name, I think he will be in the future because it looks to me like they got a fantastic discovery there in Quebec, and again, I, I'll go back to the list. It's not a remote location. There's roads going right to the property. They can drill year round. They got power right to the property. They can talk on their cell phones right on the property. You know, you see the theme there, eh, Rob, where, you know, how they how they do on the, the grading of their drill results and their share structure tells you a lot about that management team. And that's why I put drill results and share structure above the people because by looking at their report card based on those first two pillars tells you a lot about the third pillar certainly logical and who wouldn't want to who wouldn't want to follow around a smart management team all right let's move on to pillar four you could probably go a number of directions here i could venture a guess but i gotta believe visibility might be up there but uh, uh what's up uh, pillar four my fourth pillar is digital marketing you know like i said about earlier about you know spending money and wasting money at expensive marketing going to various different conferences where you know it seems like the whole focus is just to to go out and have good dinners and hang out with your friends buy some good wine if you got a good budget you know if you got good money in the treasury uh, you know that's what they're doing instead of drilling Um, but digital marketing these days is so important compared to when I first got in the business in 1993. I mean, at that point, there wasn't even a commercial internet yet. So having a website wasn't really that big of a deal. The biggest tool you had back then was a list of contacts and a a fax machine and a phone. Well, things have changed a lot since then. And the good thing about that is that you can bring your costs down quite dramatically uh, and yet have better results. Um, A good quality website, you know, one that loads reasonably fast, one that has all the key information presented in a way that can speak not just to the the, uh, geos of the world, geologists of the world, but uh, more importantly to the investors of the world because, you know, uh, geologists aren't really the ones buying the stock and funding the company. Although they can be involved with that process, uh, you know, so you you are to a degree talking to them as well. But you better, you know, realize that you're also talking to the investor community. And that's one of the big, you know, I'm always looking for sort of um, litmus tests of what you want to look for. And, you know, if you see news releases that always seem to be focused on, trying to impress the geologist of the world compared to trying to impress the stock investors of the world, the stock people, the investors that are going to put the money in so that those geologists have the money to do the work that they need to do. Um, You can look at a news release and, and I mean, I'm a connoisseur of news releases. Since I got into the business, I've been probably reading you know, 20 to 30 news releases a day. I try to stay informed of what my peers are doing. I try to stay informed of what the industry is doing. So, and I try to stay, you know, ahead of the curve on on all of these things. And a lot of it you can find in the news releases, but um, that's why I read them all, you know, every day. And, uh, and, and some of the things that I look for is if, they are, you know, I, I had a golf coach and he said, you know, if, if what they're, what the golfer is or what the coach is trying to teach you is so complex, they don't really know what they're talking about. They're, they're more or less trying to baffle you with their bullshit. And, you know, that's, I see that constantly in news releases, in digital marketing efforts, on websites, and I can tell. I, I just look at it and I go, that's been written by a geo. That's been written by a geo that knows nothing about how to talk to the investing community out there. And that's a recipe for problemas, big problemas. Um, you know, uh, it's like they're trying to impress their buddy geologists more than they're trying to invest uh, 
to inform the investors. So that's sort of the litmus test that I look for is that when I'm reading these news releases, you know, is the average investor out there going to be able to understand this? Or is this a, an effort by the geologist writing it, trying to impress his friends? Um, you know, their job is to, yes, you have to speak to the geologists of the world, because as I said, they could be involved in the process of, you know, some of these funding groups like Eric Sprott. I talked about him in the past. You know, he spent you know, quarter million dollars or quarter billion dollars in the last six months buying juniors. He's got people that he can count on that are geologists. So, you know, in a way you got to, you do got to speak to that geologist, but you know, uh, you also have to speak to the Eric Sprott guy who needs a geologist to sort of look through all this stuff. You want to impress him as well. Uh, and so, um, how they write their news releases is a news releases is, a, is an important thing because that also bleeds over into the websites. If they, you know, if they don't do a good job with the news releases, they're probably not going to do a good job with the website because they're going to be so busy trying to impress their friends instead of uh, fr friendly geologists, instead of trying to present the geological information in a way that investors can understand it as well. And if they can't really do that, you got to question their their talents as a geologist as well. Most of, most of the, the really brilliant geologists that I know, and I know a lot of them, okay, um, they can take what's very complex and break it down and explain it in a way that anybody can understand it. And so you have to ask yourself as an investor in these juniors and intermediate companies, are they trying to make this too complicated to baffle me with bullshit or do they really know what they're doing and, and, and are able to present really complex stuff in a way that I can understand it? And that, that has always been sort of a, a you know, a, a, a uh, common denominator amongst geniuses and really smart people is they can take what's really complex and break it down so that everybody can understand it. And if they can't, you might want to watch out for your wallet. Another, um, you know, another place that I see people dropping the ball are like with the, with our, um, with our shows that we do the commodity briefs. You know, you, you, you run around trying to give these guys coverage that we're not charging them anything for, and half the time you can't get them on the phone. And, uh, you know, so they're, they're, th those interviews, those video, those podcast-type interviews, that's the key digital marketing tool of the future. It's not even of the future, it's of the now. And the reason I say that is because, you know, as a – as someone who's run my own website for a number of years, I, I understand the difference between a traffic and engagement. And the best engagement tools are video and email. If they're dropping the ball on video email, they don't really even have a hope at social media. And even when I see people in social media, in the mining come, I'm seeing a lot more mining come. I like the fact that they're reaching out in these social media avenues, but sometimes I also think that they're they're sort of spinning their wheels because they're they're trying to market to multiple different kinds of social media websites with the same kind of message, and that doesn't work. You listen to some of the brilliant social media people out there. Uh, such as a Gary Vaynerchuk or a, a Jason Kalkanis, they understand that there is a different way to talk to somebody on a on a Snapchat or a or a, a LinkedIn or a Twitter or Facebook. And in reality, not everybody is going to be good at all of those things. And trying to be good at all of those things is is kind of a waste of money and time. But then I also see guys that, you know, the, some of these insiders are getting good uh, good coverage on, let's say, a Twitter, or or they got a good network on LinkedIn. Um, well, you know, keep doing that. Keep getting that right. Don't 
don't try to be a, a jack of all trades in digital marketing because, or in social media because it's not going to really work. In reality, the better you are at, at interviews, doing video and podcasts, and then your email, that's much more important than, uh, than uh, um, you know, being in every place possible. And so, you know, this, the digital marketing effort, tell, again, it goes back to the people. You know, it, it, all of these things are sort of your report card or your management. And, you know, maybe I should even put digital marketing ahead of uh, ahead of management, and make, you know, the, the, the drill results, the share structure and the digital marketing efforts as your report card to really what is the quality of your management. Just because somebody has a marquee name, maybe they're dropping the ball on half of these things. Well, you know, maybe they can still have success, but it's not it's not the best way uh, or the, you know, it's, it's giving you a chance for uh, margins of error and the less margins of error you make, the, the better your chances of success are. Well, certainly four solid pillars there. I couldn't disagree with any of them. Um, certainly if I was going to throw an honorable mention or a fifth one on there, what I think investors might want to know is what is a proper evaluation on the equity? who's you know what's it really worth uh, speak to how you truly put uh, what these companies are worth and that all four of your pillars you know basically get you led you to the right decision so uh, speak to uh, speak to valuating these companies yeah that would be the fifth pillar and uh, yeah you're you're completely on the money there robin and, and um Sort of, I, I look at it as a valuation to potential ratio, okay? So if I've got a company with a low valuation that's also looking for kind of like a smaller kind of discovery, well, that can still be expensive. On You know, ideally what you're looking for is a cheap valuation and, uh, you know, looking for a world-class project. If you can get it at the cheap valuation time um, and there is a high probability of success based on those other pillars, well, that's sort of a green light special. Um, and so, you know, I think it is important for people to say, okay, when you're looking at valuation to potential, the first thing you want to look at is valuation, okay? So they've got 100 million shares out and it's trading at a quarter. So that's a quarter, uh, $225 million valuation. Okay, so that's where we start. Then you look at the, the potential side of things. And, of course, everybody all says, okay, I got this wonderful thing and blah, blah, blah. But then you look at the drill results and it says, okay, well, it's a, it's a low-grade project uh, and it's kind of deep. So... You know, is that going to be a world-class discovery that's going to drive that valuation through the roof? Uh, I don't think so. You look at something like, uh, I'm going to use, a, uh, well, I could use our company, uh, one of our sponsors, Amex, again. Uh, I'll use one that we just cover, which is Eskina. Um, Eskina is looking for a multi-million ounce deposit. The drill results are showing that that's realistic potential. Their current valuation is about $100 million. Um, if you, you know, there's another factor that you have to look in is the price of gold and silver. So let's say you're optimistic on the price of gold and silver. You've got the great, you've got the high grade discovery that looks like it could be a multi-million ounce deposit. You've got a hundred million dollar valuation. Let's say it's 5 million ounces of high grade. Well, 5 million ounces of high grade in a takeover is worth about 10% of the of the of the the value of the metal in the ground. This is a ballpark, uh, but about 10% of the value of what's in the ground, you should see in your market valuation. So, let's say we got five million ounces of gold, and it's high grade, so they get that 10%. Let's say we're optimistic on the price of gold going to $2,000. Okay, so that's a five billion. That's uh, ten billion dollars worth of metals in the ground. Ten percent of that means they should have a billion dollar valuation. They currently have a hundred million dollar. So, in a best case scenario, 
could be a 10x type performer. That's how you want to go about evaluating things. Now, with base metals, you, you know, the valuation is, is lower depending on where you are. And that's another factor. So there's a lot of factors that go into this. You got to look at, is it remote? Is it, and going back to those, those, that litmus test, is it remote? What are the grades that they're getting? What is the potential home run uh, value of that company? Um, and so let's say it's a billion dollar valuation and it's a, you know, it's a middle of the range kind of gold project. Well, then, you know, you might be looking for a $200 million valuation. So, uh, not a, not a billion dollar valuation in the case of Skeena. I think that what they've shown me so far, I think that, uh, and, and say gold is stays bullish this year, I could see them having a two to three hundred million dollar valuation. Right now, they have a hundred million dollar valuation. So, you know, things go right, which I think they will. That's a two to three times your money kind of proposition. That's how you want to look at these things. It's it's like that Shark Tank show. You know, you got to run the numbers. You got to do your homework. You got to say, okay, well, you know, okay, uh, the Shark Tank guys go, well, okay, you guys could have a billion dollars in revenue here. Uh, you know, you're making 10% on your money. Uh, so, you know, that's a uh, hundred million a year uh, profit. Uh, and, uh, you know, you want a hundred million dollars out of me for 10% of the company. The math doesn't work. So you got to run the numbers. You got to do your homework. I find, I find a lot of people are more interested in listening to the stock promotion and getting BS pumped up than, than they are in trying to run the number, do the homework on these various different indicators and run the numbers. Ask these people, well, what is your, what do you think this could be? You're not holding them to a to, you know, to a uh, a gun to their head. You're trying to get an idea of what the goal is of what they're looking for, and then you start running your numbers. Okay, well, it could be worth this, and here's their current valuation. If if everything works out, does this does this proposition risk reward proposition make sense to me? In the case of Askina, I would say it makes a hell of a lot of sense. Uh, you know, the 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 valuation relative to the potential is, uh, you know, not much downside risk and uh, two to three times your money on the upside. Um, so, yeah, you, you know, it's really important to be looking for for companies that are doing things right and then doing your homework. Um, you know, that's that's the key that I think not enough investors in this space do. They're more likely to to jump on a, a stock promotion or you know lifestyle kind of companies that these guys all got great stock promotion stories, but at the end of the day, it's more about well you know running the company and them getting paid and and uh, goes back to you know pillar number two share structure, you know lifestyle companies are tend to be um, you know low insider ownership. Lots of expenses, not much drilling, uh, dropping the ball on digital marketing. Well, they charge the company a lot for marketing. Uh, I think you get where I'm going with that sort of stuff, Rob. Well, I think we've laid out a pretty good blueprint here, Al, to investors on how to identify a, a maybe lifestyle company versus a company who really is trying to get there. Obviously, there's there's challenges uh, in doing that, but at least yeah, well, you know, for with over 25 years of experience in this business, I can kind of do this this homework in my head pretty rapidly, um, and you know, I don't expect all investors in this space to be able to do the same. I mean, I've had some of the best mentors in the business as my uh, for geophysics, geochemistry, geology. Um, I was pretty good at marketing when I got into the business, which is how I kind of got into the business because I was able to 
take what was really complicated and sort of be able to explain it in news releases and, and digital marketing and, and, and those kind of efforts. But, you know, I don't really expect everybody to be able to do that. And, you know, fortunately, they can come to Stock Pulse where I'm hanging my hat these days doing my market commentary and they can, you know, get my, you get the benefit of, uh, you know, my my being able to do that homework effectively and uh, sort of save them the time and energy. Uh, but even that, having said that, you still there's still homework for the investors to do out there. We get them started. That certainly isn't the end of the homework, but you know we are able to give them a heck of a head start. Uh, where they're able to hit the ground running with the companies that we feature uh, because they've passed my my filters to get on the shows. Okay, before I let you go here, Al, you're certainly a unique guy. You've you've uh, entered the game here. You've put your money where your mouth is. You run one of these publicly traded companies that we talk about and uh, get to uh, prove your uh, your theory and your and uh, and and your pillar system uh, in real time here. So why don't you talk about uh, advanced gold and uh, and where you're at in the process and and how people can pay attention to that? Yeah, that's a point that I try to make a lot to uh, people that have sort of followed my work over the years. Rob is, I'm trying all of these pitfalls that I just explained and all of these tools and doing things the right way. I, I, I'm applying to advance gold. I, I, you know, we, me and my uh, chairman, we have big insider ownership. If you look at the budgets that we've had for drilling and, and, and whatnot and geophysics, you can see that we spend a lot of money on, on drilling and, and geophysics. If you look at our news releases, you'll see that we explain that complicated stuff in a way that we can talk to both the geologist and the uh, investors out there. Our project is not helicopter supported or diesel powered. Uh, you know, we can draw, I, I live in the city of Zacatecas, Mexico, and uh, I can drive 35 miles down the road on a road right up to the property, actually the road bisects part of our property, and, uh, I, and uh, I'm, I'm at the property. Um, so it's, and there's power to the property and cell phone coverage to the property. So as you can see, I'm sort of, you know, eating my own cooking there. I'm, I'm trying to avoid, I'm trying to have the, you know, the focus on drilling and geophysics. I'm trying to have, we do have high insider ownership. I'm avoiding helicopter support, diesel powered. As far as the expense of marketing goes, I, I don't spend money. I don't waste money at these various different conferences. I'll go to one conference this year, PDAC, and, uh, and, uh, and the rest of the time on my marketing, I'm working with you at Stock Pulse because we have a relationship where the, our company, my company, Advanced Gold, gets uh, you know what costs other companies money, we trade off on uh, on my analysis, so uh, you know not many companies can do that, Rob, because they're not. I, I've worn two hats for a long time. I've I've been a newsletter writer with an audience and and been doing all this stuff for a long time and looking at these various different companies. But it just goes to show you that I'm always looking for ways to get the word out there, but doing it in an efficient fashion. Um, so it tells you about how I spend our money and the kind of, you know, then you look at the people involved. I, I've been at this business exploration for 25 years. I've for over, well, well over almost 15 years now. I can't believe it. I've been doing an, uh, my own uh, newsletter uh, that I cover the business, uh, the sector. Uh, that newsletter got me on BNN up in Canada many many times and helped me to build my audience and uh so you know and then i've also been consulting you know some of the companies that i used to consult to where i would give them strategic help and we would uh, you know and that would often also affect the uh, exploration efforts i've run my own program drill programs multiple times i've you know so i've got a lot of experience and then 
who I surround myself with. Uh, our chairman owns 20% of the company. He's one of my best friends. We've known each other since we were kids playing golf. He's an exceptionally talented uh, uh, marketing guy. Um, he runs a big company up in Canada, in the, uh, one of the largest hardwood flooring companies in Canada. And he also invests a lot of money into the, into the markets. And together, um, you know, we're building advanced gold to the kind of company that we would want to invest in. Um, then you look at my advisors, uh, Jose Parga, Ran, uh, is our, the leads our exploration team. He ran the Geological Survey of Mexico for over 30 years. He's the foremost expert on geology in Mexico and literally wrote the book on the geological prospects of the state of Zacatecas. Uh, he wrote a book about it, it when he ran the Geological Survey. Um, he knows more about this state, this country, Mexico, which is a m very important uh, mining country, but also the, specifically the state of Zacatecas is uh, is uh, where ten percent of the silver ever produced worldwide has come from. We also have some exceptionally good uh, gold deposits, Penasquito, that was one of new um, one of um, uh, Gold Corp's key assets that Newmont bought them out for. It's in the northern part of the state. Mag Silver will soon be the lowest cost producer of silver this year when they turn on their um, their, their discovery, uh, Juan Escipio and uh, uh, um, Fres Fres Fresneo PLC, which trades in London, is currently the lowest cost producer and is partnered with Mag Silver on their new mine. Uh, they're about 50 miles away from us. One of the companies that uh, I talk about on the show is Orla. Uh, they are building the Camino Rojo uh, mine, a gold deposit that's about uh, 100 kilometers from us. Um, this is just a hotbed of, uh, for geology. But what makes it even more important is the state of Zacatecas is also one of the lowest cost uh, jurisdictions for exploration and mining in in the in the world, and so you know that's a pretty nice combination of great geology under ex, underexplored, underdeveloped, and lowest costs. Those are the things I like, and that's why I moved down here to uh, Zacatecas. Um, one of my mentors in the business of mining is Andre Guman that ran Virginia Gold. Virginia Gold found the Eleanor mine. It was bought out by Gold Corp. Shareholders got shares of Gold Corp. Uh, they got shares in a new Virginia. And then new Virginia got bought out where they got shares in Osisco royalties, Osisco mining. And, you know, so he's been a, he's another serial um, success story. And who's also someone I consider a, a friend in the business. And I was fortunate to be able to spend a good amount of time with Andre. And I asked him, uh, you know, Andre, why have you always stayed in the, in the James Bay lowlands of, of Quebec? And he said, well, Alan, I, uh, the geology is great. It's underexplored and I can spend the rest of my career here. So not long after I made my first visit to Zacatecas, Mexico, um, about three years ago, this actually this month, just recently, it would be three year anniversary when I made my first visit down here. I went to look at a series of projects, two of them now advance owns, and um, all of them, all the projects I went to had road access with power lines going right beside them, phenomenal geological prospects. And, uh, and, and I looked at it and I went, man, I, I can spend the rest of my career here just like what Andre said. And I sent him an email back, uh, an email not long after I got back to Canada. And I said, hey, Andre, I think I found my James Bay Lowlands. It's in Zacatecas, Mexico, and I'm moving down there. A month after my first property visits, I moved down here because I saw such a phenomenal opportunity and since then, um, you know, our, our, our uh, Tabascania project is coming along quite nicely. We, we've uh, done some, we started with drilling and found a series of mineralized, gold and silver mineralized veins. 
We used geophysics to try to um, find where the source of that was. We found a very large 1,000 by 500 meter geophysical IP chargeability anomaly, which you know looked like that's where all this stuff came from that was in the near surface veins. We drilled our first hole into it on uh, December 24th, just passed. We announced that we had a 78 meter interval of uh, sulfides. And uh, now we're waiting on the assays that I hope to have uh, out fairly soon. And, um, you know, things are moving ahead quite nicely. The other property that we acquired here is Venaditas. It's got a 3,000 by 3,000 meter um, uh, geochemical anomaly with a, geo, ge, uh, with a geophysical uh, signature right beside it. And it's about four miles from the San Nicolas mine that's owned by tech. So, you know, I, I, I'd say if anybody wants to sort of look at how I go about uh, looking at companies, they can look at my company, Advanced Gold, and see what I think is important. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. That's Alan Barry Labacam. Again, he runs the Alan Barry Reports. AlanBarryReports.com and AdvanceGold.com. And Advanced Gold is AAX on the venture. Certainly appreciate uh, you breaking this down, Al, and we'll look forward to uh, the shows that we produce in here in the near future.